five milligrams of Anivar. Now, that sounds, you know, not great, but that's for individuals. I still was able to progress at what almost seems to be like an enhanced rate while taking this stuff. And I understand this is like a steroid alternative or a natural compound that you can take to remain natty. And that's kind of what people are looking for. But for somebody like me who... So ecdysterone is something derived from spinach. It's been around for quite a while. Recently, uh, there's been a lot of hype from it due to more plates, more dates, selling it as terkesterone. This is a version of that ecdysterone where he has made some proprietary blend changes essentially to it. He's altered it in a fashion which he believes is more effective. That is something we are basically unable to comment yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Not really the point of this video, but uh, just a, a notable change nonetheless that it's not quite the exact same thing as um, ecdysterone. But it's an ecdysteroid derivative from what he is saying. Interesting enough, it was believed to be used by the Russian athletic team. It's called the Russian Special, the Olympic team in the 1980s at least. So it's been around for a long time. Currently, it's been marketing as a natural alternative to um, to people who don't want to use performance enhancing drugs and still remain natty. And it's been kind of put out there by these fitness specials. Now, we don't too often delve into this, the fitness part of YouTube and make any comments on any of these people. But this is something that does... <laughs> sway into our lane a little bit so we just want to talk a bit about why you're not natty if you use any ecdysteroids now we're not we just we couldn't give a shit any of our regular viewers we know we don't care don't care about the morality of being doping or fake natties it's not a problem we care about athletes and performance and then if the anabolic performance enhancing drugs make a play into that then we would deal with that as it comes we're not here to talk about morality of, of fake natties we don't care about people being fake natties in the fitness industry general population isn't really our problem or a thing we really talk about too often but you're but we just wanted to make a video talking about does it work and no you're not natty if you take it essentially as an opening statement on this yeah when we we're looking it up and like after watching derek's video start looking up more stuff online um one of the funniest things is like how how they really push it from nature mm -hmm. so it's like it's a spinach ext extract essentially and they're they're changing one or two things but it's this natural thing if like if you're unaware right when they get testosterone and whatever whatever they do to it afterwards testosterone is gotten from yams when they get it most of the time it's gotten from just the plant like a yam like a sweet potato so you could say just taking testosterone, um, which almost every performance enhanced athlete in the world will be taking, that's technically coming along the same lines. They're getting it from a vegetable. So just thinking you're taking a, a spinach extract doesn't really have any uh, any bearing on <laughs> if you're natty or not. It does seem to play a lot into the, uh, the amount of people which will use it. So... Anyone who follows more plates, more dates will have seen that people his stuff sells out within a couple of minutes of his uh, his own particular blend of this type of performance enhancing drug. Uh, so recently he did a video where he one of his sponsored athletes prior to being sponsored did a well supposedly prior to being sponsored did a video where he went through an eight month kind of training vlog and he did a synopsis of his gains. Fitz is just going to give you a very, very quick rundown of the synopsis of what he's, he's made in terms of numbers. So what we have here is Cooper Doran, uh, a training period from late November to late June. So that's November, December, so eight months roughly of training. And then we get to see kind of how he gets on. The things that are being measured here, so he has body fat percentage, lean tissue mass, weight, he had other measures there, uh, waist hip ratio, all these things. Those are the main three we're going to look at. Uh, just for ease of kind of illustration, we've just thrown them into a graph. And what you start to see here, as he explains in the video, is that it ends up being kind of what we might classify as two training cycles. He has a bit of a break in the middle um, and the, the kind of results reflect that. So if we, you can clearly see there's two different kind of spikes here or two different periods of training. And it's probably a bit simpler to see from these, right? Um, if you take the first period of training, there's four scans in the mix. 17th of November, 16th of December, 1st of January, 31st of January. So they're all quite close together. Um, and what you see is the alterations in body fat percentage, lean tissue mass and weight. So when you look at weight here, starting at around 215 pounds. So he's below 100 kilos. And then he ends on the 31st of January at 233 pounds. By far the most kind of impactful measure here is lean tissue mass. So when you're looking at a, 
a substance like this it's it's how much lean tissue mass you're going to put on he goes from 186.9 pounds up to 196 pounds so you're getting up on a very very uh, noticeable or a sizable change in lean tissue mass if you had a change of this size in a kind of statistically significant group you're definitely looking at a significant gain in lean tissue mass if you had a, a kind of sizable cohort in a study um but yeah you see a, a change in, in body fat percentage an increase from 13.2 to 16 percent so less than three percent change um but you get a huge change in, in body weight so going from 215 pounds to 233.4 pounds this was a what he classed himself as a kind of like a, a gaining phase he wasn't specifically cutting when he was during it what you do get this is when he's kind of also in lockdown and not working so he's talking about having much more time to recover having just basically to do nothing else except sleep and train what you see in the second cycle if you want to call it that you got 27th of, My Jesus Christ. 27th of march 24th of april 26th of may and 21st of june um, this is he classed it as a cutting cycle and you see notable decrease in body fat percentage a notable decrease in weight um, but most important of all you get a still increasing lean tissue mass and this is like the really important thing is that when you get people who aren't utilizing certain substances when they go through a cut phase most of the time they will be successful in bringing body fat percentage down they'll be successful in bringing body weight down but they'll very 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 often be detrimental to their lean tissue mass and a lot of that drop in body weight won't in fact be from the percentage of body weight made up by body fat um it will nearly always be a fairly serious proportion of lean tissue mass if you were just looking at this so i mentioned it earlier as a pretty tissue selective substance and you were testing it in a serious group and this was findings from 100 or 200 people all following the same training program and they did these cycles twice with what you could what you might uh construe as being a, a calorie surplus and fairly serious hypertrophy training in the first uh in the first cycle and then a calorie deficit and a bit more of a high work capacity training style in your second piece these would be very significant results obviously we can't can't for a second decide if they're significant or not because it's one person and it's over two separate blocks both of which are around three months uh per block but they're very very interesting findings also you see so in this case cooper seems to be a pretty experienced strength athlete or like experienced gym goer he said he's been training since he was 12 he's now 25 so he has a lot of years built up in the gym um, and the interesting thing is his bench press goes from it goes up like 20 pounds I think his bench ends up being like 355 or maybe 375 so it's it's by no means a light bench press it's not like he's a weak person who just has a kind of naturally good physique it's clear he's been lifting some weights um, but that those kind of tissue values are the important part so obviously an N of one, an individual case study isn't really a study. It's not a scientific experiment. We don't have any investigative parameters that are really weighty. Like Fitz said, we can't really decide if they're significant. You know, for any of the OG viewers of the paper review, we've had a lot of discussions on what significant really means in terms of statistical analysis. And there is something happening in the wider sports science community in particular in terms of, uh, you know, do statistically significant values or determining if something is statistically significant really means something especially in terms of biology and out training outcomes like this in terms of sports science so cooper stuff certainly on the outside if he was getting that from creatine you'd be like damn creatine does something mm. so the fact is uh, as a novel perform performance enhancing drug something different it's certainly like something's happening especially with the performance sensing numbers he used a consistent metric for determining his values so he used a what to use again he used a body scan we'll probably talk about that a bit more when we go talking about limitations at the end so he used a body scan so the important part is was consistent for him when he was using that as his metric so there is still some variability in those some of those variabilities could be quite high you could be looking at stuff like 10 percent variabilities or more in those uh, biometric analysis so not the best but certainly something worthwhile in terms of someone logging a video on the internet and putting it on youtube so we've got there's quite a bit of 
literature on ectosteroids. And there's one from the Archive of Toxicology. It's coming from the University of Cologne, Germany, as opposed to any other Cologne. So it's ectosteroids as non-conventional anabolic agent, performance enhancements by ectosterone supplementation in humans. Uh, we're not going to do the typical analysis like we do where we break down the full paper as this video has other stuff going on in it. But quick rundown, we had four groups, 46 male lifters, at least one year of experience. Six of those dropped out before the end of the study for not completing the, sub the parameters. They went through a 10-week training program, three times a week, squat, bench and deadlifts focus. They had their analysis done at the start, body weight, mean muscle mass. They were split into four groups. There was a placebo group, of course, which received a placebo tablets. There was a control group, which took two tablets of this ectosterone supplement that they took. It's not the tocresterone, it's an ectosteroid, a supplement one, which they list in the thing if you want to go find it, winky wink. There was two ectosteroid groups, EC1 and EC2. One group took the two recommended capsules, and then the other one took a increased dose of this. So they went through this 10-week training program, a variety of different analyses were taken. Very, very interestingly, one of the things that was very notable about this was that there was seen to be no negative health negative health effects on their biomarkers. So, long story short, what we saw was a what they determined as a statistically significant increase in a lot of markers of what we would be looking for in terms of training. So, most notably, the groups increased their bench press by an average of eight kilos compared to the control group, which increased them by an average of three point three kilos. They determined this to be significantly significant between groups. As coaches looking at athletes, if someone made that significant more increase over 10 weeks, you'd be pretty happy with that in general. So if we look at that from a kind of outside perspective, they mean muscle mass increased significantly, squat and bench or deadlift and bench also increased. They kind of focus on the bench press in this for some reason. So a quick little section from their discussion of the results. So anthropometric and performance parameters. The positive effects of ectosterone administration and training on body weight and muscle mass could be clearly shown. In both parameters, a positive time effect was generated in EC1 and EC2. In addition, a dose-dependent effect could be observed. EC2, the high-dose group, additionally showed significant time by group differences compared to the placebo and the control group. Similar positive effects on both weight and muscular hypertrophy have been demonstrated in 600 milligrams testosterone administration from a 1996 study, which you'd never get to do again. Although the effects are not as strong with testosterone supplementation in human, the significant differences between the uh, placebo group, group one, group two with the active testosterone and the control group can be detected. Uh, they also did some in vitro myotubule analysis on C2 to C12, and these showed positive hypertrophy effects, which is something that is significant and does bear noting. Long story short, it really fucking looks like ectosteroids do something. Yeah. The recommendation from a different study, ectosteroids, a novel class of anabolics from 2015, promptly recommended that these be added to the S1.2 other anabolic agents of the list of prohibited substances of the world anti doping agency long story short ectosteroids look like they do something they yeah. look like they do something pretty significant compared to other typical performance enhancing drugs in terms of supplementation ones that are not banned by wada i don't understand why it's not banned yet honestly we're obviously not doctors we're not giving any recommendations but if i was a competitive athlete it looks like i'd be all over this if you were a competitive athlete in a country where you get tested a lot. Yes. And you might have loads of weightlifters going to the Olympics. Yes. And you needed some tissue selective anabolic agents. Mm -hmm. This might work for you. Go why, like, why might it not be banned yet? Is it like, is it due to the fact that it works on, what do you say, it works on the, the estrogen receptor more than it works on the well, androgen receptor? So they're showing there's no offenses in the androgen receptors and it's, it's People are throwing it out there confidently that works in estrogen receptors, but it's only recently been shown in vitro that some of the estrogen receptors that it seems to bind to, uh, but it's not very sure of the exact mechanism of action yet. And I would be concerned would there be any long term side effects of this? Maybe not, but it is very, very hard to know. But as you were saying, we probably should talk about is every other substance that has ever had results like this mm -hmm. has had side effects associated with it yeah so um 
in the 1940s when they started supplementing with testosterone and soldiers then when they started developing more and more potent things there was more and more side effects associated with them then the the introduction of the sarm uh that was brought about with this kind of hope that there be no side effects it's now coming online that there is more and more side effects associated with sarms that they never thought there would be it's like well at the doses that you get performance and benefits from by the looks of things yeah so if you use like therapeutic doses for what the project say six year old housewives yes yeah yeah so if you had a serious burn victim um, and they were growing back a lot of tissue then taking serums at those therapeutic doses are probably very very low side effect burden um, and also like certainly much much better than like a traditional antibiotic agent but when people start taking them in a performance enhancement or enhancing uh, arena there certainly does appear to be more and more side effects showing up and I think to be honest it's going to be the same here so with all the other providers we've looked at even though Derek's one seems to be in some way different from the rest of them um, you're talking about anywhere between 35 and 45 euro for 60 capsules what they talk about on a bottle or most of the recommended use is two capsules a day I know in one of your studies they were on two capsules a day as well yeah. now they're talking about six capsules a day this Cooper Doran stuff I know definitely for the latter half um, of his training peak so that second graph we looked at he was on six capsules a day and he was taking all another substance on top of that. So he just took a normal run the mill ecti steroids one. Okay. Which adds more benefit to just to taking ecti steroids as a supplement. So one of the things we wanted to talk about with this was the kind of subject of the mental gymnastics people will run through in their head to remain natty. So everybody wants the positive strength gains and size effects and performance benefits of performance enhancing drugs. But they, a lot of people don't want to be associated with the no longer natty, the kind of dark side of the, the performance enhancing world. And people will look at something like this and tell themselves, to be like, yeah, fucking, it's still natty, like, yeah. you know, because it's, absolutely it, fine, like. it's coming from spinach. There's no negative side effects from it. It doesn't interact with your androgen receptors from what it looks like currently. So therefore, you still remain natty. But the magnitude of benefits surely are the things that dictate whether you are beyond the norm rather than the substances you take so if this turns out to be incredibly beneficial several iterations down the line and we have a very very potent ecticeroid but guaranteed no side effects can you then use ecticeroids and remain natty status whereas if it's twice the effect of uh i don't know name any anabolic steroids with zero side side effects or negative effects are you still the natty it's, it's crazy the mental gymnastics some people will run through in regards to this um, and a, a more advanced form sensing drug therefore you're still natty yeah I think whether like so to answer the question of like is this going to be the future of of drugs in sport it's very unlikely this is going to be the future of drugs in sport yeah um, because what you have here is you have something akin to a like a SARM so people and not in terms of its structure but in terms of how people view it so they view it as this thing that has less or no side effects isn't taking drugs to be cheating at sport and it takes a number of the other boxes in in that kind of mental gymnastics spreadsheet that people seem to have but the reality of it is and we when we talked to Broderick last year this was one of the things he would laugh at and say like it's kind of just a dumb question um a lot of the side effects that you don't get with this are actually things that are incredibly positive for sports performance so you get positives from the banned substances that are already on the list that might include things like increased ability to learn new skills increased ability to react faster so literally the speed that the message can travel down your nerve tissue at is faster due to increased myelination around the nerves you also get strange things like increased pain tolerance when you take certain compounds you might get uh you might get increased uh, levels of concentration you might get decreased levels of uh, anxiety around an event so there's all of these things that are coming as side effects to the the compound itself being a, a somewhat anabolic agent 
but you also get all of these other androgenic things. So I don't think this is really where professional or semi-professional or just really serious athletes are going to go anymore. Um, or I don't think this is kind of one of the routes they'll end up going down for their PEDS usage mm -hmm. because it's just, it's not the kind of be all and end all to get this really tissue selective substance and to get that without any of the other side effects um, is like getting a really, really fast car, but then not having good enough tires on it to be able to grip the road. We also have no idea, though, though we, they might have these effects, though. We haven't really, we don't yeah. see anything from good athletes talking about this in terms of not just looking at muscle mass gain, in terms of actual sports performance. So this could use could be rampant in the elite levels of sports. The circles are very small and word spreads very fast and things like this. So this could be incredibly rampant use and we would never really know. And I'm sure we would have heard about it by now, but very, very likely there's several people at the Olympics right now using this substance. So let us know what you think. Are you still on the right side of Natty? If you use ectosteroids, have you used ectosteroids? Will you go use ectosteroids? Let us know in the comments. Let us know what you think of this. And uh, maybe you never know. You might see it marketed as Azticus and Azalol if we, uh, if we ever come up with a supplement. If you are writing in the comment, if you could let us know how you kind of justify it to yourself or if you don't justify it or if you don't even care, mm -hmm. um, that's what we're re we really are interested in that as well. From a personal note, not so much to, to help us gain on the channel or anything. No, it would be though. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys.